Hello everyone, and um, welcome to uh, video one of three for this week's um, lecture material for MPL 607, uh, Grassroots Mobilization and Targeting. I'm Dave Ebner, um, one of the instructors for the class, and I'll be kind of, um, I guess, frontlining the, the lectures for this week. So we're going to go through, um, this is going to be the first of three. In this lecture, we're going to talk about um, some of the political science literature and how it informs um, kind of our, our strategies, our, our tactics for voter mobilization and persuasion, and vice versa, how the real world has informed that literature. Because, you know, over the course of this class, I, th I think you've maybe gotten comfortable with the idea that political science and, and real world politics don't always uh, mesh super well together. But this is actually one of the areas where the political science literature is is not quite on the cutting edge, but at least is, is embracing the state of the art in voter mobilization and persuasion in terms of how it works in the real world. And um, maybe a quick anecdote is, so I'm a political scientist now by trade. I, I went back to USC, got my PhD, but in the four or five years before that, um, I was working political campaigns for the Democratic Party, doing this grassroots mobilization and targeting. And I think one of the ways I got into grad school was by explaining to the, the people in these academic departments that uh, I was fond of and, and had used the literature um, on my political campaigns, not only to help my own strategies, but really to kind of convince skeptical volunteers that this was the right way to go. So I'm going to walk through the literature in this video and then, and then get more of the uh, kind of nuts and bolts like, all right, after you do the reading, what do you do in your, in your campaign office now in terms of grassroots mobilization and targeting? Not really going to, there's no magic here. I, I'm sure... Um, Maybe familiar with a little bit of this stuff already, but this will be a summary and a walkthrough of the political science literature and really what we know from both field and, and kind of lab experiments about what works um, on the ground when you're um, trying to contact voters. Excuse me. So I think one of the places I'll start is that when we're talking about grassroots mobilization, when we're talking about voter targeting, I guess, in this sort of way, we're really talking about um, something that we, maybe you've heard this term before. DVC, so direct voter contact, right? And when we really do mean direct here. And I think that's maybe one, one way to really get your, start to wrap your head around what kind of falls into this category, what doesn't. So direct really means, I think maybe the, the way I would like to summarize it is like, this is when you talk to a voter and you know their name. Right. So there's a much there's a big difference between knowing exactly who you're going to talk to, knowing them by name, knowing some information about them, obviously from the voter roll or, or vote builder or whatever. And then the kind of um, voter contact you do when you're, you're just kind of reaching out to a broader group. So let's just con contrast two things here. So we think of like television advertising as indirect contact. Right. You blast it out there. Whoever's in the in the blast radius gets that message, right? For the ones that are closest to the message, get it more, right? Whatever, right? And in this kind of situation, and, and I'm sure you've gone over this before in the previous weeks, you're looking for volume of contact or repetitive contact or to kind of saturate the environment with this kind of indirect contact, right? Um, direct voter combat, sorry, direct voter contact is something entirely different. This is when you have your walk list or you have your call sheet or you have your mail list, right? You know exactly who you're talking to. This would be also be the case with like texting or or kind of more personal forms of voter outreach and digital digital platforms, right? So on Facebook, you know somebody's name, you can send them a message or whatever, right? So in this situation, you know the, the voter's name, you kind of know some information about them, you've targeted them for a reason, and now you want to have kind of a, a more a more substantive form of contact than just kind of like blasting on a message, right? Okay. So with direct voter contact, um, and, and moving to the literature, we really kind of break this down in, into to three practical kind of things. So if you're thinking direct voter con contact, what do we mean? We mean doors, so door-to-door -door canvassing. We mean phone calls, right? So direct phone calls to a list, right? We used to uh, talk about direct mail a lot more, and I think that's kind of it's fallen off a little bit, although it should, it will still be important with some constituencies, especially older voters, right, where you have their address, their home address, they don't really move a lot. And then digital, but this is more, I would say, social, social media, right? Like I said, you can do some forms of direct contact when you have 
voter information or constituent information um, with on those digital platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, right? Their, their names attached to the account. So the literature, the, the political science literature kind of like looked at campaigns and wanted to know if this was effective or, or maybe there, there's someone like you was trying to convince their organization or their boss that this is what they should invest in. And this is the form of, this is the strategy or these are the tactics that we should, we should employ, right? To, to, to help mobilize or help persuade voters in our, in our district. So, and really, if we think with either one persuasion and mobilization, the, the logic of this form of contact is going to hold true. Although just keep in mind that persuasion is much more difficult than mobilization. So when we're talking about the rates of success or the potential rates of, of success or failure, it's going to be much more successful to mobilize someone who's already registered and involved than it is to, to persuade someone to, to change their mind about um, who or what they support. So uh, we can start with, so most of this literature and you're getting it assigned, what you'll hear is like Gerber and Green are the two main, the two main guys here. And they, they started this kind of stuff back in, I think that, uh, 2000, 1999, 2000 was when this, this literature started getting really, really kind of noteworthy. I mean, it still really is. And there's been these, these gentlemen and, and their, um, grad students, their, their, their colleagues and stuff. There's, there's maybe like 12, 15 papers by these authors, but including somebody else. So Gerber and Green, and then you have Gerber, Green and Shakar, Gerber, Green and, and Hilligas, all this other stuff, right? So, but really I'll, the summary points are this, is that first of all, that they show that this stuff works. So there's probably not a lot of complete skeptics in here about <laughs> voter contact, right? But this will reinforce that this is the stuff that not only people in the field know works, but political scientists have done the, the studies and, and they support them, right? So kind of a consensus nearly, and you don't really find that a whole lot between kind of like pundits and, and, and practitioners and, and political scientists, right? But this is one area where we are kind of in, in agreement that this is the stuff that works, right? So what the literature will tell us is that some stuff works better than others though. And what we find is that doors work the best. And um, some of the initial studies and, and following on later, in terms of uh, mobile, voter mobilization, we found that doors could shift people's turnout 10 to 15%. So this is a big bump. So this is someone who may not have planned on voting, registered to vote though, you go knock on their door, you have a, a, a short conversation with them, two to, two to 10 minutes, you know their name, you, you ask them to vote. They're 10%, maybe 15, maybe 20% more likely to vote depending on the effectiveness of your message. So as I said, for persuasion, these numbers are gonna dip a little bit, but some studies have shown as, as high as three to 5% success in persuasion. And really when we're looking at variance, really one of the, the things you want to remember is the more personal the contact is, the better. Not necessarily the longer, but kind of like the more personal, and we would say that is the deeper kind of canvas, right? When you really get to connect with someone on something that you know they care about um, or that you know is important to them, and like I said, you, you know their name, you know, you know some information about them, the more personal these exchanges and these connections can be, the more effective they're going to be. That's a, that's a good principle to remember. And then we can kind of like anticipate then how the rest of this is going to work, right? So we find that phones can be three to 5%. And we're not talking about robocalls here. We're talking about personal calls, right? So, and uh, a, a note on that is that, so the more personal, the better, obviously, but there seems to be higher rates when you use volunteers versus paid canvassers, right? People um, give them more credibility, right? There's not a paycheck involved. You can kind of trust, um, or voters will trust a volunteer more than they'll trust a, a paid operative, um, even if that person's like you know like a, a professional or whatever. I just feel like they have some some skin in the game. They may not relate to them as much. The other, and speaking of relatability, the other thing here too is that we know that um, social identity is an important part of politics, and and social identity is an important part of trust and, and political trust. So the closer, the more kind of like the people that you're talking to that you can get your canvassers or volunteers to be the more successful they they'll probably be and one example of this is like so if you're if you're running a political campaign and, and we, maybe we've all been familiar with this a lot of your callers a lot of your volunteers are going to be retired people right a lot of retired old ladies or old, old men that 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 obviously care a lot about this stuff but don't have a full schedule and they're happy to come in 
and and make some calls, especially in the middle of the day when there's not a whole lot else going on. Or maybe they're already out writing about they got something else to do and they can stop by the office. So this is commonly where a lot of your callers, especially will call maybe less so your, your walkers, right? But if you can have callers, call people like them. So have your retired callers call re other retirees. Have your, uh, your, your stay-at-home moms or your soccer moms call other soccer moms, right? The closer that these people can kind of share um, some connections, and the easiest way to establish that is, is kind of through these social identity things. So you want to have people talk to people like them. It's going to be more effective. On the other hand, there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off there between someone who's super knowledgeable and, and professional and enthusiastic and passionate and, like, <laughs> you know, bright and sunny versus someone who's, like, you know, just kind of like them and they can get along and maybe it's not an expert conversation. It's more of a chat, right? There's a trade-off there between how prepared or kind of like technically savvy your canvassers are and, you know, their, their likability or their relatability to the people that they're talking to. There's a little bit of a trade-off there. Ideally, you'd have like super well-trained <laughs> professional canvassers of, of all walks of life. That's not really going to happen, right? But it's easier for people too. It's also easier for your callers and your canvassers to talk to people that they're comfortable talking to. And that's, um, not everybody's comfortable talking to, to any everybody else, especially when they're strangers, especially voting. So you can make it easier on both your people that are doing the calling or canvassing and then the, the people receiving that stuff. If you can kind of match up personality types or, or that kind of stuff, it'll go a little bit better. And help you not only around the margins, but this stuff can ch change things pretty significantly. A couple percentage points, right? If you have your your retirees calling other retirees and talking to them about retiree issues, it's just a really effective way of doing direct voter contact. And you can apply that principle broadly, right? Senior college kids to talk to other college kids at the campus, that kind of thing. Okay? So we know that phones, so like I said, direct phones, maybe three to five percent for mobilization and maybe a little bit less, right? One to two percent for persuasion, which is still pretty good. You can get off a lot of phone calls over the course of a shift. Then last, or sorry, third, we'll talk about direct mail. And this, we're talking about like, uh, maybe less, like percentage points, right? 0.01%, 0.05%, maybe up to 1%, depending on like, the issue salience, the, the size of the election, the effectiveness of the mail piece, right? And this isn't, we're not talking about here. Again, there's a contrast here with this kind of mail between like, you know, the flyers that you just post are everywhere, just go in everybody's mailbox. That's not what we're talking about here. That would fall into the indirect category. We're talking about here with direct mail is like a letter addressed to a certain person with information or an ask from the campaign. You just have fundraising ask or something like that, right? If we're doing a persuasion mail piece, a mobilization mail piece, we know their name, we'd send them something in the mail. Assuming they open it, they're gonna it's gonna move their their odds a little bit, or move their chances a little bit, and then like I said, you know, cut that down a little bit for for persuasion from mobilization. And then last, we're still waiting. You know, political science takes a takes a little while to catch up, run all the numbers, um, get through the publication process. Um, so we're still waiting a little bit more for for kind of more robust information about how these digital outreach strategies happen, but. Um, the preliminary stuff I would see is it kind of falls in between here. So if you can send a text message or a direct message to someone, especially younger people, are going to find this just as receptive or perhaps more receptive even than phone call. Right. So the 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 contrast here would be like these aren't the mass test text here. You're not blasting out. Right. We're talking about hi so and so. Hi Tony. I'm Dave. I'm a volunteer with uh, the <laughs> the Iron Man for President campaign. I'm here to talk to you about voting, that kind of stuff. So you know their name, they know who you are, you're making a connection. And in that text message too, and you'll see a lot of the text messages I know I got this year about voting, address me by name. Hey, Dave, I'm a volunteer with Joe Biden's campaign. How are you planning on voting this year? Where are you planning on voting this year? That kind of stuff, right? So the principle here, the more personal, the more direct you can make it, or sorry, the, yeah, the more personal the, and, and the more direct you can make these forms of contact, the more effective they'll be. But most importantly, the most personal, right? So going to their house, having that conversation. And I wouldn't say you know, there's going to be diminishing returns at some point, but longer conversations are going to be a little bit better. And if, if you're training your canvassers or as you're training your canvassers, there's a tendency, you obviously want to get volume here. But if you have a, a persuadable target and you know someone who's really on the fence or, or waffling a bit, it does actually make sense to allow your canvassers 
at the door on the phone to spend time with that person. Um, you know, we're talking, not talking about all day for one vote here, but there's a big difference between having that 30 second conversation going, oh, thanks, have a good day. You know, if you need more information, I'll see you later. And maybe hanging out for five or 10 minutes on someone who you maybe can, you know, you can shift because those truly persuadable voters we know are few and far between. And once you have one on the hook, it's fine to spend an extra couple of minutes with those kind of people and have that establish that connection that maybe it's personal, maybe it was with the campaign or maybe it's just between the two people that are having it. But having that conversation is worth it. Um, and think about this. You'll, you'll be making a lot of calls or knocking on a lot of doors that never answer. So it's rewarding for your canvassers and callers as well to be allowed to kind of linger a bit with some conversations that are going particularly well. Now you would kind of draw the line where you already, if you know this person's already a supporter, you know they're not gonna support you. You don't wanna stand there and be debating back and forth or you know, whatever all day. But if the person's persuadable, if the person uh, wants more information or wants to kind of just spend more time with you, that's fine to train your canvassers to do that. This isn't just a lit drop and volume's not the only thing that's important here, especially with persuasion. Mobilization, maybe you move it on down the road, but early in the campaign, it's fine to to train and to allow your canvassers and callers to spend a little bit more time with, with true persuasion targets that seem persuadable, but maybe just need another push a little bit, or maybe more time, maybe a little bit more attention, right? Um, the other thing that uh, the literature will, will political science with literature is, is really interesting on, <laughs> um, I'll wrap up here with this little tidbit. So let's talk about what those messages are when you're doing direct voter contact and how you can make them effective. In terms of mobilization, we have a pretty strong idea about the kind of stuff that works. The first is that you need to remind people that the election is important, right? Um, we also need to remind people that the election might be close. And the, the one thing that you always want to drive home is that your campaign or, or you personally, if you're the candidate or if you're just the canvasser, that you're counting on this person, that it's going to make a difference to you whether they show up or not. So giving them yeah, a reason to feel important, to feel emboldened, and just to feel needed, and that they'll be letting someone down if you um, if they don't show up, or if they if they end up voting for the the other the other candidate. The other thing to keep in mind here is that social pressure actually is a pretty effective tool here, especially at mobilization. So social pressure a little bit less effective for persuasion, although you can indicate that you know lots of friends and family, and most people are supporting your candidate. That's the right thing to do in general, but this kind of more like um, civic duty message of social pressure will be really effective if you're trying to mobilize and turn out voters. And what you want to do is kind of, <laughs> it's not necessarily a guilt trip, but it's kind of reminding of their civic duty, but also letting them know or indicating in some sort of way that people will know if they don't show up. So some of the most famous studies here have been um, kind of flyers that are distributed in neighborhoods that make the empty threat of... <laughs> publishing voter turnout information to your neighbor. So it's kind of like letting you go to a neighborhood and you drop a flyer and the flyer says, hey, it's your civic duty, go out and vote, here's how to register, whatever. And then after the election, we're gonna be publishing the information about how your neighborhood voted or how, how often they voted or how often you voted. And this kind of accountability really is effective uh, for American voters. So it, there's this implication that we all kind of have or hear all the time that it's your civic duty to show up and vote. And if you don't, you're kind of slacking on, on your role as a, as a small D Democrat, right? As, a, as an American. And sending that sort of message or reinforcing that sort of message, maybe not as explicitly as telling your voters that you're gonna rat them out to their neighbors or family if they don't vote. But this kind of idea that it, the election's important and, and to put a little bit of, of pressure on them to perform their civic duty, this stuff has been shown to be an, <laughs> almost alarmingly effective um, at, at kind of creating the outcome. Now you can, and there has been, and maybe you've heard some stories, there you can create backlash by doing this sort of thing. So it's a fine line to walk. So this maybe is a sort of message, the social pressure that you want to build into your direct voter con contact versus do some sort of mass lit drop where you um, where you threaten to do so. So I'll start to wrap up there, but um, 
if you're more interested in this literature, we've obviously assigned reading for this week, but you can just go into Google Scholar and put in Gerber in green, right? It's Gerber in green. And their whole kind of catalog will come up. They have a textbook now. They have a, a kind of like a compendium that summarizes all their findings. But these are some of the most, uh, I, I pulled out some of the most important findings and the most interesting stuff. So just a reminder, direct voter contact. You know the voter's name. What do you want to do? You want to persuade them that you're the right guy, you're, your candidate's the right person for the job. And then you need to mobilize them to vote. Direct voter contact is going to be the most effective way to do that. Most personal, go to door to door. It's one of those things where I think instinctively we know as campaigners or as, as political people that this is this this is like the dream, right? You want you'd love to be able to go to every single voter's door in your district, have a long conversation, a meaningful conversation with them, establish a personal connection, and and kind of encourage them to to support you. Obviously, we can't do this at every door. The costs here start to get prohibitive. And that's the last thing I'll say is that it's very intuitive that we would do this as much as we possibly can. That doesn't happen in the real world for a couple of reasons. First, it's expensive. It's hard to develop this kind of information, hard to train canvassers, hard to get materials. But second, and I really do think that this is where most of the bias comes in, is it's hard work. <laughs> we're talking about grassroots this is as grassroots as you can get you're walking on the grass of your neighbors to go knock on their doors right this is the true grassrootsy stuff you'll break a sweat you'll get lost <laughs> it'll take some time you get rained on right the idea that door-to-door -door canvassing is incredibly important i think is is well established but the numbers really reinforce it and the numbers are really stark here right the difference between knocking on someone's door and having this conversation and sending them a piece of mail, having a digital conversation, or even less so doing these more indirect forms of voter contact, right? Television, digital, this kind of stuff, right? Lit drops. This is gonna make a huge difference and it's worth your time and worth your money to do it as much as you can and can campaign should do it more. Not only is it expensive though, it's hard work. Uh, but if you're willing to do that hard work, convince your canvassers to do that hard work, train your staff to prioritize this kind of stuff by prioritizing dvc and by pouring resources into it you will reap the benefits if you do it right um and and that's the the benefit right so yeah it's expensive yeah it's hard work but hard work pays off um even in politics um i know it doesn't always feel that way um in the world or in politics but this is one of those cases where it will especially if you develop good lists if you have good data right if you have good messaging this is how you deliver it. Um, and not only do we know that in the real world, have we all experienced it, I've personally experienced it, but the political science literature actually knows what they're talking about and has a lot to say and has a lot to add and will help you um, think about direct voter contact and why it's important and how to do it. So uh, thanks for joining me for video one, part one of this week. Um, look forward to part two where we'll talk about um, how to kind of implement, how to think, make DVC a center of the campaign and how to kind of run that in your office. Um, and this is going to be talking to volunteers and, and talking to staff. So um, look forward to that. Um, I'll see you there. Thanks.